The Carnegie Mellon Quarantine Database Talks are made possible by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real and by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Hi right, guys, thank you for coming. It's a, another quarantine database session. This Today we're happy to have uh, Norvold Riang, I'll, I'll, I'll edit that, um, who is a software engineer at, at Oracle on the MySQL team. He's the lead of the, of the, the MySQL optimizer team, um, which covers actually query optimization and query execution as, as I'll talk about here. Um, he is a PhD from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Um, he's also a teaching faculty there where he teaches database system, database architecture and design. So we're super happy to have Norval here today. It is 11 p.m. where he is in Norway, so we thank you for staying up late. Uh, and as always, the way we do this is if you have any questions, please unmute your mic, say who you are, and where you're coming from, and ask your question. And do, feel free to do this anytime. We want this to be a conversation. Um, and as always, we want to thank the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real for sponsoring this event. So with that, Norbert, the, the floor is yours. Go for it. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, so uh, when asked to, to present here, uh, Andy said, can you do something on, on the MySQL query optimizer? And said, might be more interesting to talk about the whole processing pipeline. Um, I'll get back to, to, to details about that. Um, First, it's, um, I'm going to talk about things that are in MySQL today, uh, today, things we've done before, but also a few things about what we're thinking about the future. And if you're from the future watching this, um, then it might not actually be the way it turned out. Just, just the, the gist of this. The, the US election oh. is tomorrow, so there might not be a future. Throwing that out. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Good luck with, with that point. Um, so, um, I, I'll briefly go through the history of, of MySQL, um, just to give you kind of the understanding of why MySQL is the way it is. Uh, then I'll give you an overview of, of how query processing in MySQL works, and then I'll talk about the refactoring we've done. We've done quite a lot of refactoring uh, of the whole query processing in MySQL the last few years. And there I'll go into more details about each stage of, of processing. And then uh, since Andy asked, I'll give you a overview of the query optimizer. Um, I'll take that at the end and talk about how it works and how it doesn't work. So uh, let's start with the history. Um, MySQL started, the first release was in 95 or it was an internal release. Version one was not released to the public as far as I know, uh, which makes MySQL 25 years today. Um, it became part of LAMP stack. So uh, with Linux, Apache, and, and PHP together, uh, this was kind of really became a, a popular thing in, in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, a lot of simple websites started up using MySQL. They grew more and more advanced uh, with time. But they started with very simple OLTP workloads. Um, basically, single point select, so you select a single row based on primary key or that kind of thing. Maybe a few joins if you're advanced. That's where we started. And, and like MySQL and PHP have a lot in common. For instance, they have the same view on, on type safety and that kind of thing. But uh, I'm not talking about that today. But they kind of all this evolved together. And it started with very simple things. and it grew into something more, more complex. So the timeline is um, very shortly. It's version 3.21 was the first one that was kind of called production quality and released um, to the public. Um, and you see in 2003, they got union, but not intersect or accept. So what's happening here is that it's a small company producing an open source product and basically jumping on whatever the, the largest customer is asking for. So there's a talk at, from LinuxConf Australia from 2014 with Stuart Smith from IBM. He talks about why did we do this and why did we do that with, with MySQL. And basically, it, it all boils down into the customers paid for this and they, they paid for that. So it's not until 2008 with Sun Microsystems that you get a big corporation backing MySQL. And Sun Microsystems wasn't afraid to spend money, so they, that gave MySQL a bit more time to, to step back and look at 
how does this work? How do we want it to work? Uh, not just jumping for the next big feature that the customer asks for. Um, and then in 2009, 2010, depending on uh, which state you look at, the, the, the start of acquisition or the approval by, by uh, the EU, um, Oracle acquires Sun. And Sun Microsystems has spent time on adding storage engines to MySQL, uh, transactional storage engine, because InnoDB had earlier been acquired by Oracle. So um, MySQL didn't have a transactional storage engine that wasn't owned by Oracle. But now in 2010, Oracle owned both, and there was no reason to, to do anything else, uh, basically. So with version 5.5, MySQL had InnoDB as the default storage engine. Um, then, well, I joined in 2011, so the first version I worked on was 5.6. Um, all the major projects were already assigned to other people, so I did bug fixing for a year, uh, which brought me around all the code base to, to look at various problems. There were bugs, right? So I saw all the things that were wrong with the, with the source code. Um, then 5.7, um, version 8 is a... Um, a big change in that the catalog of MySQL, called Data Dictionary in MySQL, is moved to InnoDB. Before that, it was based on various files um, external to the, the storage engines. Um, that changes a lot of stuff. You actually have a transactional engine doing the, the catalog. You also see that CTEs, uh, like with the clauses and, and window functions and, and stuff, so more advanced queries, more analytical capability uh, is adding to, to ADO. And in 2019, um, you see we're still adding features after the release of ADO. So there's a change here in policy. Um, the users actually asked us to, to change policy and start adding feature in point releases. So before this, we, we added features in 5.5, 5.6, but we tried not to add them in, in the point releases of each release. Uh, but now we are adding features as we go. Um, one interesting thing to, to note here is that uh, you see in 2019, it says hash join. And that's actually true. MySQL didn't have hash join until 2019. I'll get back to that later on, talking about the optimizer. Um, so MySQL basically become very popular, very fast. And the focus was on adding features, not to keep the design, the architecture up to date. So I would say, based on what I know, that it outgrew the design. The code just, they had to add new features and the design was not kept, um, kept up to date. Uh, while the usage grew from small websites to large websites, they had more data. So it's more important that the optimizer picks a good plan. Um, and lately, they also want to do analytics more complex queries, more joins, many more tables, um, window functions, that kind of thing, making the job harder for the optimizer. There's more optimization to do. It's hard to find a good plan. And at the same time, it's more important, right? So there's a, a, a growth in complexity here. And, and it's more important that the optimizer does a good job. So uh, if you look at how MySQL does query processing, um, it's the classical model. Um, parse, uh, MySQL, we have the step called prepare. It has different names, different systems. Uh, and then optimize and then execute. So prepare basically does kind of name binding and these um, query transformations like semi-join, uh, so in an existing semi-join, that kind of thing. So um, one thing that is different in MySQL than some other systems is the, the kind of pluggable storage engine system. We use it internally for mainly two uh, storage systems, InnoDB, which you get with MySQL Server, and NDB, which is what is the backing for MySQL Cluster, which is a, a network um, row store, a, a distributed row store in, um, that's used for mostly telecom. Um, I think it's also behind some of, some of these uh, big online games. And um, they have different properties, so the optimizer has to adapt to different qualities of, of these things. 
And recently, we also got a third internal engine to, to care about, and that's a bit special. Rapid is an analytical engine, a column store, distributed column store, main memory store, uh, and it actually has its own execution engine. So we optimize and execute in there. Um, so that affects some of our decisions going forward. So this will be released as a cloud service only um, in the future. Uh, it's currently in beta testing with, with some customers. So, but this affects um, quite a lot of our choices going forward, the, the, having the, the second execution engine. Um, let's see, yeah, the Parson Bison, the executor is a typical Volcano iterator executor. Um, What's a bit special about MySQL is that the design, as I said, it's, it started out simple and it's very much designed to do nested loop inner joins. That's the idea behind the whole thing. And it's, you can see it in all the data structure from the parser to the executor, um, that there, that was the intent. And everything else has been added on as you go, but no big refactorings. That's uh, the reason for, for the work we've been doing lately. So, as I said, it probably started out pretty straightforward and then it gradually kind of, yeah, diverges. And, and I'm, there, there's an idea behind this, it's not random graph changes I'm doing here. For instance, uh, doing name resolving during execution, that actually happened. Um, the idea was that hey, we don't need to optimize this until we actually need to run it. So uh, we don't need to spend time optimizing a subquery until we actually use it, because maybe we don't have to evaluate it. Maybe the query executes in a way that it's not necessary. And then maybe you don't have to resolve it either. Um, and that's fine as long as that's true. But what we saw that was that we started trying to execute things that weren't resolved. So you're trying to, to execute and refer to a column that hasn't been bound to anything. So uh, that's, of course, a bug, but we had many of these bugs. And it was clear that we had to clean this up and, and get back to a more clean stage separation. So we started refactoring. Um, and no user ever asked for refactoring. Um, they, they like the effects, but they don't ask for it. And they don't ask for anything that doesn't have a, a visible effect or benefit for them. But um, they do come to us saying that it has fixed a lot of bugs. Um, the stability of MySQL has increased a lot. Um, and whether they know it or not, the features they've been waiting for, they, we, they depend on refactoring. So uh, I'll show some features later on that we and, and try them into different uh, refactorings with it. Um, and the new thing with Ado is that we are delivering features in point releases, which means that we're also delivering refactoring in point releases. So we have to try not to break things. Um, we're trying really hard, but it's uh, not e always that easy. So the main thing is to, to separate refactoring from removal. So even if we refactor and, and try to fix a problem, we may have to put some extra code in there to maintain and, 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 and still have some almost buggy behavior just to have backwards compatibility. Uh, and then in a future version, we can, we can actually remove that. Um, so, um, yeah. sorry, so, I mean, maybe, maybe this is jumping ahead, like what is like the MySQL testing pipeline look like? like if you're doing major refactoring, then you, your unit tests are all broken, so you have to rely on SQL stuff. So how, yeah. Presumably, like, you have all these logical tests that check the correctness of queries. We have lots of them, yeah. Of course, yeah, okay. Um, and, then are you, and then, but you had existing C++ unit tests. As part of the refactoring, do you, are you maintaining them and updating them, or you just say, screw it, throw it away? And as, assume they or have, like, SQL-based tests that can test whatever it was the C++ test was testing. That makes sense. Yeah, so we... From, from the old days, we mostly have SQL-based tests, actually, not much okay. unit tests. Okay. So we are writing unit tests for new stuff, but uh, there's often not much many unit tests to, to, to change. Okay. Um, that's kind of the sad truth, but also the, the, the um, convenient truth. Uh, 
there's there's no unit test to to fix, but uh, there's a lot of SQL tests to to um, make sure they're still running. And okay. and those test suites are are pretty extensive. Um, not always systematic, but there's a lot of, of regression cases added on over the years. Um, and, and they really pick up a lot. And we do a lot of, of fuzzing of, of queries and, and that kind of thing. Do you use SQL Smith or do you have, like, does, do you have something specific? specific oh, we have SQL? our own. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Is, that, is that open source? Um, uh, let me see. Um, does it have a name? Or like, I, I, I RQG know. is one. I think that one is open source. Um, we have uh, a new one called Gator. Uh, that is in the process of open sourcing, if not open source already. Okay. Um, that, that's the idea, at least, to have this open source. Um, okay. So I'm not sure of the state of everything here. Um, I know they were working hard to open source Gator. I, I hope it's open now. OK, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we have, we have lots of, of SQL tests. Uh, the, the whole test suite takes, takes ages to run. Um, so we, we try to do something on every push, something on daily or weekly schedules. But uh, sometimes we do break things. We just try very hard not to. Um, so let's say the first obvious thing to do was to separate stages. Uh, we started 10 years ago. Um, we finished a few years ago. It was not a concentrated effort. It was something, uh, something we did in background, something we did when we had the opportunity at least to begin with. And then as we got closer to the goal, we started setting more strict schedules and, and actually planning for, for getting a, a full separation. Or yeah. This is an ideal fi uh, figure. It's not necessarily the entire truth. Like We still execute a bit during optimization, for instance. But it's under control. We know what we're doing there. Um, so the separation is, is pretty clean now. And this was really the main thing that improved stability. As I said, these unresolved things that you're trying to execute, that was a, a huge class of, of bugs. And it also helps feature development. We, we have fewer surprises. Um, if you do a, a query transformation, for instance, um, to unnest a subquery into a, uh, to something, then then you have fewer surprises if everything is properly resolved first. So that was the, the first thing we did. Um, and then we started looking at each stage. So the first thing was the parse uh, stage. Um, the, we're using Bison, which is normally supposed to do a bottom-up um, parsing. Um, but we had so many semantics actions doing weird things that it wasn't really bottom up. Um, so we fixed that for, for a DML, for select, uh, insert, update, delete. But DDL statements still are a bit messy there. So the idea here is to get a parser library that we can reuse in other products. For instance, we have um, MySQL router, which is a proxy put between your client and your Server, uh, servers and it can do like HA or load balancing or sharding, that kind of thing. And sometimes you need to understand queries and then the best thing would be to have the exact same parse in both, both products. So that's a, a goal that's in within, within reach now, I think. Um, uh, it's in, I don't know, next year or so, we should probably be able to do that. And Later, we've done a lot to the um, prepare stage as well. Um, so MySQL, until recently, didn't really do prepared statements uh, as well as you should. Um, basically, uh, the prepare statements was, um, was resolved. The name and type resolving was done every time you executed it. So now we have reached a state where we only do optimization execution every time you execute a prepare statement. That affected type resolving quite a lot. Um, so do you we know, remain. Do, you, do yeah. you know whether like 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 
because I think Postgres caches things. Do you know what like the commercial guys whether they're uh, doing aggressive caching? Because it's you, you sort of defeat caching of all plans. You mean? Yeah, like for prepared statements, because it sort of defeats the purpose of a prepared statement if you're going to plan it every single time. Yeah. Uh, so our goal would be, of course, to to cache plans as well. We're not there yet, but we we are now at least the step before. Um, so um, I'm not sure if Postgres does that. I know. Oracle and SQL Server, I think, do it, can do it for, for any type of statement, actually. Um, you can just recognize the pattern instead of just looking at what is actually prepared. Um, Postgres, I think, I mean, Matt can tell you this, my, my PhD student, because he implemented yeah. it in our protocol. I think if you execute the query, same query like five times, then it triggers it as a, like a, like a, it caches the plan. Yeah. So, so the, the, um, the challenge there is that the, the different, um, parameters you give to that execution may change what is the optimal plan. Um, right, you know, yeah, I understand. Yeah, but, but yeah. Um, it's, I mean, it has this, it's like, but, but, but if you know it's like a, you know, a, uh, like a primary key lookup, yeah. the selectivity is always the same, right? Yeah, it's a primary key lookup, then, then it's safe. But uh, yeah. if it's more complex, then it might be slightly different. So, sure, I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying you always want to cache it, but like, um, again, I think SQL Server can be a bit intelligent about how they're like what they're yeah. caching, and then can generate multiple plans. But it surprises me that you're you're basically saying you're going to rerun the optimizer every single time in yeah. the location of a prepared statement. Yeah, we do. We do. Yeah. Um, uh, our goal in the future, of course, would be to not do that. Um, but uh, we haven't sold that. We, we're just at the at the, the step where we are are caching the logical plan. Um, before optimization. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. But we're, we're there at least. Um, okay. That's a good thing. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. And yeah, we cleaned up how we do transformations. So they all done in the same way. It's, we do one dive down the, the AST. So we, on the way down, we do name resolving. And on the way up, we do type resolving and do transformations as, as we see. And also constant propagation and, and constant folding in, in, uh, on the way up there. So without this, especially without the, the uh, stage separation, we would never have been able to deliver CTEs and window functions and, and lateral and, and the first table function my school, JSON table, um, uh, is also made possible because of this. Um, I, I think it's not impossible to implement this in kind of the old stuff we had, but um, we wouldn't have been able to do it by now, I think. Um, it was just too complex uh, a structure to, to deal with. Um, so we, it's been simplified a lot for us. So we do faster feature development. Uh, we, we really noticed that, that we're doing that. Next step we looked at was execution. Um, we had, uh, people would say we had an iterator model. Um, the engineer who did this would say that we had seven. Uh, we had seven different inf interfaces. Some were push, some were pull inside the executor. Um, that was interesting. Um, and it was very much nested loop based. Um, so it was nested loop through and through. Um, it didn't know how to do anything else. But do you, do you think that sort of like, I remember looking at the MySQL code in yep. 2000. It was, we were trying to start HStore. We looked at it in 2008. And it looked like because you have like the MySQL layer, the top part is, couldn't assume what the storage engine was. So it had sort of this hodgepodge API. So do you think that's, that was a remnant of that? Like it, like it was my ISAM, then InnoDB came along, and therefore things were sort of different? Or, or was it just sort of like, it was written assuming was my ISAM from the very beginning. And, and sometimes it was pushed, sometimes it was pulled. Well, I don't think that assumption really affects it. Um, okay. I think they just locked themselves to, to nested loop too early and, and wrote things as explicitly for nested loop. Um, okay. And I think that was the, the, the mistake they did. Um, okay. Interesting. So over the last two years, we have refactored the whole thing. Uh, the code is reused, but it's, it's just wrapped in a, a single iterator interface. So we can now put things together the way we want it. Um, and as you see in, in the last bullet point here, um, 
nested loop join is suddenly not the core of the algorithm. It's just an iterator, which means we can add a hash join. Um, so I like to say that the old one was like a jigsaw puzzle where you can, you, it's modular, but you can only fit it together in a, in a very few ways. Um, but now we have Lego. Um, so the immediate effect of this was that um, we got rid of uh, quite a few temporary tables. Uh, because temporary tables um, was the go-to solution for connecting things that didn't fit together. Um, because almost everything could, could read from or store in a temporary table. So if the iterators didn't fit together, a temporary table was inserted as a buffer. And that's not good for execution times, but um, if you're in a rush, have to deliver a feature, of course, that's the solution you go for. So um, this is now all modular. Um, and this is necessary because you can't really start looking at the optimizer until you've, you're able to, to express the plans uh, and the execution you, you need to, uh, to do. So uh, three features that came out of this directly from this uh, refactoring. Um, MySQL explain has like different formats. You can do JSON if you want to do, uh, MySQL Workbench uses the JSON format to do visual explain. So you have a, a graphical view of your, your query. Uh, the traditional one is to print a table. Uh, that table is also very nested loop join oriented. Uh, it, it, it shines through there as well. So in order to really express the new execution tree we had, we add a new explain format. That's just a, a very simple walk of the, uh, of the tree. I can show you here. So um, you have a, an iterator for, for a join, for table scan, and you just uh, returns a, a, a line in the display. This is very much like Postgres. Um, so um, it should be familiar to, to Postgres users. Um, and actually, the, the old explain code interpreted the plan separately from the execution engine. Um, surprisingly, I can only remember, I think, one bug where, we ex where the, the explain output said something else than we executed. That's surprising. I would have expected much more, but um, we were able to keep it in sync. Um, but now, with this implementation, we are sure that what we are printing is what we are executing. And that also makes it that simple to add explain analyze. Um, I remember asking um, the guy who did this, uh, I, I think I asked him before lunch one day and said, how much work would it be to add explain analyze now? And said, not much. And then like a few hours later, he came back with a hundred lines of code, say, this is the prototype, it works. Um, it was that simple. Uh, of course, now it's a bit more code, but um, it's basically the same thing. Uh, we wrap each iterator in a timing iterator. Uh, we intercept all init and read calls, uh, and then just uh, store some timestamps and, and counters, and then you get explain analyze. So this is a really good outcome of just a simple refactor. And then hash join, of course, was also added there. So let's look at the optimizer. Uh, that's what you, you want to hear about. Um, this is uh, Hellerstein, Solmreich, and Hamilton in 2007, um, the query optimizer of MySQL. Uh, the full quote is, is more like this. Um, it was entirely heuristic and relied mostly on exploiting index and key foreign key constraints. Um, I don't know when they looked at the code base. I did a, a search a few days ago, uh, and I saw at least traces of, of cost-based um, computation in there in 2000. I think it was from 2000. Um, maybe it wasn't released in 2000, maybe it released in 2003 or something. But um, it's been cost-based for many years. Or Parts of it has been cost based for many years. I, Mike didn't read the code. Let's, not, let's be honest here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I admit it's, it's still today too much relying on, on heuristics um, and, and, and rule based uh, stuff. Um, there's not enough cost based decisions. 
Um, do but, you, um, maybe, maybe, but, you, maybe yeah. you'll get maybe you'll get into this. Do you is does MySQL is MySQL collecting the statistics that would allow you to do a cost based search better? And then you just don't. Uh, we do have statistics, but uh, not enough. That's Got my it. conclusion. Yeah. Okay. I'll get back to that. Um, actually, in this slide, I think. Um, so, for a table, we have cardinality and a number of pages on disk. Um, and for indexes, we have number of distinct values, number of null values, uh, number of pages. And if you have a multi part index with uh, several columns, you have um, NDV for every prefix of, of, uh, of columns. So, if it's ABC, then you have NDV for A, NDV for AB, and all that kind of thing. Um, but if you don't have indexes, you don't have any statistics for, for any column. Uh, and if you compare that to, for instance, Postgres, then, then you see there's a lot of stuff lacking. Um, we do have histograms, though, um, single column histograms only. Uh, but they have to be manually added and manually updated. There's no automatic updates. Um, however, I did, we did have students last year who looked at automatic updates, so that might be coming. Um, and um, yeah, and, and histograms, it can be singleton histograms if you have enough buckets or, or their um, equi height histograms. But you have to update them manually. Um, and if there is an index on the column, um, we will ignore the histogram because just because they are manually updated, uh, indexes are assumed to be much more up to date uh, because they are index statistics are automatically updated. And of course, like everyone else, we have these fallback assumptions of if you have no information. But in my school, since we don't have column statistics, these are probably more used than in many other systems. That's um, and they are very crude, right? They, it doesn't really reflect reality. It's just made up are numbers. The, are those default values, are those, are those exposed through my.conf my or like, like can, can I tune no, them? No, you can't configure. No, okay. not these. Uh, they're hard coded in, in the server. Um, but even, even if you couldn't configure and you could never find one number that's good for all columns, right? It's, um, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. It, it's, sure. it's just a way to, to make the, the, the cost formulas work in the end. Um, you need a number. But um, yeah, whenever you hit these, it's, um, yeah, you have to be lucky to make it, uh, make it fit your, your query. So let's look at the, what's actually happening in your optimization. Let's start with the transformation. So this is in the prepare stage of MySQL. Um, it's not part of the optimizer, really. Um, but it, it really affects the optimizer. So, we do static transformations that are not cost-based. They're always done. Um, there are switches to turn on and off if you want. You can hint them on and off. But if they're enabled, they will always be done if possible. So this is like uh, well, view expansion uh, in there, um, merging derived tables and use and stuff into, um, into the other query. Uh, in exists, I need to seven join and to join stuff, um, standard ones. Um, we also have some transformations that are specifically made to make this analytics engine, the rapid engine work. It, it can't execute all types of um, subqueries. So we are rewriting queries into what is not necessarily more optimized, but something that it can execute. But those are only enabled for that engine. So that's a, a uh, very specific optimization. Um, but these, these things are always prepared between prepared state based executions, uh, unlike the actual optimizer step, which is currently repeated every time. So the transformations we do um, for derived tables, views, and CTEs, we treat them the same. They are either materialized or they merge into the other query. Um, uh, recursive cities, uh, we all materialize. I don't know exactly how to do it otherwise. But, uh, there might be techniques that we haven't looked at. Uh, if we materialize, we are able to push some conditions from the auto query block into the derived query so that we can derive tables so we can filter out rows early on. Um, we 
there's more to do there as well, but um, we can do some of it at least. We have, um, if you have subqueries in predicates, you can, we can materialize, we can do semi-join, anti-join, or we have a way of rewriting in any queries to, to exists. And we have a special execution mode for exists that doesn't really materialize the thing, but it just returns true false if anything exists. So it's, it's a optimization materialization in a way. Um, or, when you decide to do, like you, you decide that in the optimizer and you basically hint down the execution and say, okay, just, you know, just check whether true or false don't actually produce any results. No, this, this is actually, this is, this is uh, not uh, uh, in kind of, this is in the prepare stage. This is always done. And we do a, this is not a cost-based optimization. Okay, okay, I, I got it, I got it, I got it. Okay. So this is rule-based. Got it. And we do constant folding, um, as I said. Um, but we also do constant folding at the start of the actual optimized step, um, because MySQL does execute um, materialized single row or zero row tables. If, if it's maximum one row, MySQL will materialize it if it's constant um, uh, and extract the values and put it into predicates and propagate all these constants and do a separate round of folding. Uh, and this seems to filter out quite a lot of, of joins actually. We, we, we are able to, um, to reduce the complexity of the query. So while the transformations we did in the prepare step are designed to add more joins, to, to unnest some queries and add more joins, giving the, the join planner more options, this one is actually uh, trying to reduce those, those options. Um, so it's cutting away things that we don't really need to join in anymore. So a, a interesting thing here is that we, uh, a student of mine, he tried to, um, to run the join order benchmark on, on MySQL the other day and, and get some numbers. And, and um, some of these things were just, the, the um, intermediate results were just optimized away uh, because of this uh, constant ev uh, evaluation and, and uh, propagation. But, but so, the, the, the way that's triggered is yeah. basically you, you say, okay, you're doing the lookup and it has one or two, zero rows, then, then you make a no, blocking. Um, if we can deduce from the query that it's a only going to be one row. So um, it has to be evident from the query that, that it can't be more than one row. Primary key lookup or within a clock. Primary key lookup yeah, or yeah. Um, um, if you have them in, for instance, in... Um, in the select list or whatever, uh, if you have a a um, a um, scalar subquery that can only return one value, for instance, select one plus one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so if it's obvious from the query that this can't return more than one row, zero or one row, then we do this. But we don't really check statistics. We InnoDB gives us statistics, but it can't tell us if there are kind of exactly how many rows there are. Um, yeah, got it. Right. Okay. So we, we can't really rely on that. My ISM so, did that uh, very predictably, but um, not in ODB. How can you, I mean, it's tough to say, but like, because, you know, you're not a cloud service, so you don't see every query anybody ever runs in MySQL. But in, in, like, with all the customer workloads you have, you have access to, how often does this optimization get fired off? Can you say like like twenty percent of the time, ninety five percent of the time? I don't have percentage, but it, it's uh, frequently used. Yeah. So 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 basically, like if someone wanted to, this would be a worthwhile optimization that somebody should add to their system. Maybe. Well, um, it does take time to execute it, so I'm, sure. I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, yeah. But you would have to execute it anyways at some point, so. I, I'm, I'm not really sure, kind of, you are executing it early and you are able to propagate these numbers. Um, but I'm not sure if, the, if, if you didn't do this, you would have more joins in your query, but I'm not sure if it would be that much more expensive. Um, Got it. Okay. I, I, I can't really guarantee that. No, I understand. Um, yeah. 
I mean, for select one plus one, maybe that makes sense, but like accessing yeah. a table that, of course, that it could be selected from a function. That function could be, you know, computing a hash and would be expensive. I don't yeah. know. This, this is very cool. This, sorry, I, I don't mean it. Yeah, yeah. This is cool. But it's, it's, it's an optimization done there, but also it breaks down the, the barrier between optimization and execution. So we, we're kind of, we haven't really decided if we want to keep it or not. Um, it, it could go away at some point. Um, I guess we, we'll have to at least do a, a proper evaluation of, of the effect of this. Okay. Um, so let's go to the, the actual join uh, ordering and, and optimization. Um, to get the, the base table access, we have, this is what's on this slide, we have what's um, called the range optimizer module. So it, it mostly looks at, at range scans. Um, so we can do all these different operators um, and it produces a index range scan or several index range scans, so several ranges in, in the same index. Um, or it can do index skip scan, which is, um, that was actually a feature that Facebook contributed to us. Um, so if you have an index on A, B, and C, but your predicates are only on B and C, uh, we can skip from, from the first value of A to the second and, and do the, um, the ranges on B and C. So this, of course, depends on how many distinct values of A there are, but we have that statistics. So we can do a, actually do a cost-based decision on, on, on using this one. Um, so I guess at least Facebook found some value in this. Um, it's pretty new, so I, don't, I haven't really seen enough numbers to know how many queries it helps. Um, I think it's just you guys in Oracle have it, like the like regular Oracle. Because I, I, I learned skip scans from Oracle. I, I don't know anybody else that has it. Yeah, well, we have it now, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but it seems to work for, for some use cases at least. Um, then we have index merge, uh, where you read from two or more indexes and uh, read the primary keys, you do the union intersection, and then read the full table. Um, so InnoDB is a, a clustered index, so everything is sorted by primary key. Um, so all, all indexes have, have the um, refer to the primary key of the, uh, of the base table. Um, so it's not like, like uh, for instance, Postgres, where you have a, a kind of row pointer instead of, of the primary key. Um, and in addition to statistics, um, the range optimizer can use index dives to get accurate costs. So it actually goes down to the index and, and asks how many rows have this value um, until it reaches a certain configurable uh, limits. I think it's like seven or something by default. Um, this depends on your workload, of course. But um, the the thing here is that get the accurate cost, not not only the um, the uh, estimates. But it's quite expensive, um, so that's why it's limited. Uh, but it helps for uh, for instance for for in lists and that kind of thing. This is also where we do uh, spatial. Um, access methods. So within an overlaps contains that kind of thing, it's mapped to a, a scan of, uh, or a, a lookup in the, in the R tree. Um, so what's a bit special about MySQL is that this is a separate module that the planner then uses to get one suggestion. So it can choose between table scan, index scan, primary key lookup, or secondary index lookup. Uh, or whatever the range optimizer suggests. So for some reason, this was not baked into one algorithm. This is um, one thing for range, and then you have all the other stuff. Um, so I'm thinking if what, so I'm trying to be an archaeologist here and, and look at what Stonebreaker and, and Henderson and, and Hamilton saw, maybe they saw this one, and at the time they looked at it, the range optimizer didn't exist. I think that was added to code base in 2000 or something. So maybe this was then heuristic based. Now it's cost based. So um, that might explain that, that, uh, that quote. Um, but as we say, the weakness here is that we only, the range optimizer only returns one access method. Um, 
And especially if you would try to do anything like in interesting order uh, tracking, that would be a bad idea, I think. Um, because you don't get the full picture of all access methods that are, are available to you. Um, another thing we, we can do is to use the covering index instead of table. So um, if you have an index that happens to cover all the columns you need, then, then we can use that. Um, so that's the, the base table access in, in MySQL. And then comes the actual join ordering. Um, no, sorry. Uh, one more step of, of things we can do uh, for access. Um, condition pushdown. So if you have a condition that is not used in the, the index lookup, but it can be evaluated on the index before you read the, the base table, then you can push down into the index and, and get it evaluated. So you filter out rows early on. And if you're using NDB with MySQL cluster, you can push down conditions that will be filtered network traffic uh, internally to the stored engine. Uh, then we get to, to join ordering. And that's where the <clears throat> it starts getting interesting. I, I was shocked when I read this the, the first time and, and saw the code. Um, so basically, my school from the start did an exhaustive search for all plans. Um, it first generates one full plan. It has a list of tables, and it adds one by the other and ends up with the, the full list. Um, and then, then it has one complete plan, and then it tries permutations of that plan, um, basically keeping the prefix and, 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 and changing the, uh, the kind of um, end of the, 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 uh, the list until it has generated all combinations. This is, this is not a, a very efficient algorithm. Uh, and, and at some point, it realized that and added pruning. So, if a partial plan is, is worse than the, the full plan, the best full plan you've seen so far, then you just stop there. Uh, cut off that branch and, and start create, uh, generating a new prefix. Um, but even then, it's, it's bad if you have more like six, seven tables, I don't know, um, around there. So there's a cutoff where it just gives up with uh, the exhaustive search and then switches to greedy. So let's say you have eight tables. It will generate a, all possible prefixes of, of, let's say, six tables. Then it reaches the cutoff. And the last two tables will be added by greedy search. Um, so um, this is kind of worst of both worlds. It has a horrible execution time uh, for the exhaustive search. And then the greedy search just misses out on opportunities. So not a good choice, I would say. Uh, you, but it actually works. That's, that's a surprising thing. It, it has served my school well for 25 years uh, for some reason. You're not even picking the algorithm at this point, right? You're just trying to do ordering. I guess you, you, yeah. only, had nested, you only had nested loop joins. So that's all you had before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Left deep nested loop uh, kind of thing. Um, so the sorting we do up front, that's um, on estimation of how many rows you have to, to read, not rows returned, but rows scanned um, when reading. Um, when sorting that way, you, we are kind of making the exhaustive search, uh, we are, we're guiding it towards a, a pretty good planet to begin with. So it can prune off more stuff. Um, I actually remember when that, we, we looked at this and we added this sorting. And, and it helped a lot for, for us. But still, the base algorithm is, it just screens for dynamic programming and you know, some more reasonable approach, right? If um, only there was a paper that did this, right? Yeah. <laughs> if, if, for instance, in 1971, 79, someone had, had published something about this. I mean, um, it's, it's, yeah, 79, yes. 79, yeah. <laughs> so, so we're still trying to catch up with the same 70s in, in my school. Um, but the surprising thing is, is how well it actually works. Um, uh, I'm, I'm surprised that it, it's uh, stood the, kind of the test of time so far. It hasn't really crashed yet. Um, but it's, it's very close to, to, to collapsing. For instance, if you start doing proper analytic queries with this one, you have far too many tables for this exhaustive search to handle. And then you start doing greedy. 
and and it just goes downhill from there. Um, so uh, just to, to finish this uh, this discussion, it it does goes uh, left deep. Um, Nested loop. It, it's smart enough to pick uh, index lookup look on the inner table if if it can or cost based. We used to have block nested loop that was removed in 8.0 actually um, and replaced with hashto. Um, we looked at it and tested it and for all most at least reasonable use cases, uh, it's better to just switch to hash code. So actually, it doesn't do that block test loop anymore, but it plans for block test loop. Um, not much tweaking there to, to adapt it to hash code. Um, we didn't want to touch the costs computations too much. So we could have tweaked it to do a cost computation that's more close to hash join, but we tried to be more conservative and use hash join less um, because we're doing this in 8.0, which is already a public release. Um, so basically we do, we do nested loop join and almost by accident hash join. Um, it does not track interesting orders at all. It doesn't try to. Um, so I think the next slide is on, on challenges. Yeah, so it's exhaustive combined with greedy. Uh, this is, this is we, we know how to do this. This is not a way. Um, and the idea of this range optimizer on the side, I think that misses out on some good plans. Um, although it's not necessarily obvious that it does, but I, I after analyzing it, I believe it does. Um, there's a no choice of, of join algorithm really in, in there, uh, not a good one. Um, so it's, it's built for nest loop and it doesn't uh, use hash join to the extent it should. And we actually have heuristics to select sorting or index order. And it turned out that sometimes it fails so spectacularly that we recently added a switch to, to turn off this, these heuristics and just uh, not just leave with the plan you had in, and don't try to use the heuristics to, to change your mind. Um, so this sorting thing really doesn't work. Um, we, we are not able to make a good choice there. Surprisingly enough, it, it works in, in most cases, but uh, some cases it, it really fails. Uh, by the way, you're getting the, the engineering view here now that everything is bad. Um, but that's because we are, we have kind of realized that this, this, this is the end of life for this optimizer. Um, we have to do something. We have to do something that can last um, for a longer time. So our requirements is, well, not only lefty plans, allow for some bushy plans. Um, we have to select different own algorithms. Um, we have to track interesting orders. Uh, that's kind of base level here. And then we had this stuff with, with NDB and Rapid um, requiring different things. So we have to somehow be modular and extensible enough to handle the different costs models for these and different operations. Um, it's not it's not necessarily straightforward, but it's not that complicated to get it um, good enough, at least, um, I think. Um, at least a, a regular kind of system R-like optimizer should work well for, for both cases. Um, that's what we've seen so far, at least. But you're gonna need, you're gonna need better statistics, right? So like, at some yeah. point, MySQL is gonna have to like, you know, do background analyze, right? Like, and like, yeah. yeah. So second to last point here on the, on this slide, um, we'll probably need more statistics. And what comes to mind immediately is histograms for all columns, like, like Postgres. And maybe also the, this top hundred uh, thing that they do. But we are definitely going to need more, more uh, statistics. So um, this will show up at some point. Um, we also know that it's, we can't incrementally improve on this optimizer. We have to basically write it from scratch. Um, but the good thing is that we have, with stage separation, we have the input 
interface, we had an output interface, and, and we can try to do as much as we can inside that contained little box. But it, it does, of course, affect data structures that come all the way from parsing and down to optimization. Uh, so some, some changes are, are, will happen everywhere, but um, uh, we, we try to concentrate as much as possible into that stage. And we're going from bottom up. Um, we're not doing any cascades type optimizer. It's just that bottom up is safe and well known, and we know it works for, for rapid, for instance, for the analytics engine. If we would were to do something like uh, cascades for, for this, I'm, I'm afraid we would have to have different transformation rules for that plan for rapid and for InnoDB. That's my main worry there. Another thing is that cascades optimizes, um, I would say a bit less known, um, harder to find people who are really understand them that well. Um, so bottom up seems safe, something system all like. Um, I have students that do the cascades, right? So you can have yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But the, the, uh, the Germans make strong arguments that the bottom up is the better approach. Like the, Thomas yeah. Neumann has his paper about this DP algorithm. Yeah. We're, so, doing, ca we're doing cascades in our system because that's, that's what I liked and I did it. Yeah, yeah, I, I like the idea of cascades as well. Uh, but um, we, we decided we're doing bottom up. It's, we consider it less risky, um, yeah. I think, for us at least. Yeah. Um, but we are looking at these, um, these hypergraph algorithms uh, coming from Germany, right? So that's an interesting kind of improvement on system R. Um, so, so those are really interesting to us. Um, and yeah, uh, moving on here, we, we definitely want to take this range optimizer thing and, and make sure we evaluate all access paths for, for interesting orders. Um, I don't know if, you, if you've done a lot of work on, on spatial queries, but um, for instance, um, k nearest neighbors seems to be much easier in a in kind of a, a model where you just um, where you keep track of interesting orders than trying to to detect these queries in um, based on the, the query structure that we would have to do in the, with the current optimizer. Um, because they, then you just produce um, your points in, in the interesting order of, of nearest neighbor, uh, and then it just pops out at the end, whether you do a distance scan of an index or if you do sorting and, and then distance uh, calculations. Um, but yeah, more statistics. Um, then the, the main question here is, how do we switch? Um, if, we, if we're creating a new optimizer, how do we decide that it's good enough? Uh, the old optimizer is so simple, it might get lucky. And, and a proper cost-based uh, optimizer will always have estimates and that kind of thing and get unlucky. Um, so I'm, I'm really hoping that it will turn out to be, to be lucky all the time. But, um, I think at some point we just have to declare that it's good enough and, and, and deal with it. Um, and we've seen similar problems before when changing the cost model. If you tweak the cost model a bit, then suddenly um, you, uh, queries are behaving differently and you always get some regressions, performance regressions. It, it never fails to happen. Whatever you do, you get performance regressions. Um, Whatever good you try to do, do, someone always has a query that goes wrong. So I guess that's why MySQL people like, like hints so much. Um, also because the optimizer is a bit weak. Um, like for analysis, we have explain, explain, analyze. We also have optimizer trace, which is more or less a brain dump from the optimizer. Um, this is a, a non-documented format that is meant, written by optimizer developers to be read by optimizer developers. So if you have a query that performs badly um, and contact MySQL support, they will ask you for an optimizer trace. So basically you 
set a session variable saying, I want to do optimize a trace, you run your query, and then it's stored uh, somewhere in information schema. And um, this brain dump is, is just all the major decisions done by the optimizer and gives us cost numbers and, and um, some raw numbers from statistics, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's really helpful. So explain, analyze, and optimize the trace. We always ask for that if, um, if we get a performance issue. And then the solution, unless we can do find a bug or anything, is usually use a hint or an optimizer switch. So uh, hints can, of course, turn on and off any type of optimization. Uh, can force or disable access methods or join orderings. Um, and the optimizer switch is a session variable that does all this um, enabling disabling of, of different uh, transformations and optimizations. So um, normally, if you have only a few queries, you do optimize hints. If it affects a lot of queries, you do the optimizer switch. And just a kind of final note on these hints is that We've started changing our hint syntax from this old style, which we call, I know call, call intrusive hints, because they, they intrude on a query. Instead of writing proper SQL, you're writing straight join instead of join. Um, so you're actually rewriting a query. Uh, but we took the idea from, from uh, Oracle DB and added hints as comments. Um, so we can remove the comment and the, the query still works. And that makes it, makes it easier to automatically insert hints. So we have, we have a plugin that can do pattern matching of incoming queries and rewrite the queries. So people use it for, for all kinds of, of things. But uh, the intention here is to use it to add hints. So let's say you have an application you can't change. It has 100 queries, and two of them are performed badly. Then you use this one to pattern match those two queries and add uh, the hints you need. Um, so this is kind of a, a bailout for us uh, if you have performance issues in an application you, where you can't change the queries. But on the other hand, most of our customers are able to change their applications. They have in-house um, or open source applications they can change. But this is, this is what we have used so far when things go wrong because we are changing cost numbers. And I think this will be the go-to solution for anything that affects optimization as well. We're just hoping we, we won't have to use it that much. Um, so to summarize, between 5, 6, and 8.0, uh, we have refactoring, refactored almost, uh, should the, not the whole query processing pipeline, almost the whole. We haven't touched the optimizer, really. Um, and so far, no user has, has discovered this. Uh, at least they haven't had any problem with it. Uh, we've been talking a bit about it uh, the last year or so, but um, uh, people really haven't seen any issue here. Um, and our experience is that refactoring is so worth it. Um, lots of bugs fixed immediately, and we see feature development speeding up uh, a lot. And this was, when I joined in 2011, uh, I was surprised how much we were allowed to do refactoring. Like you always hear that eh, managers don't want you to refactoring, they want to deliver features and all that thing. But no, we, we were really encouraged to, to refactor. Um, because for the first time in, I guess, 15 years, my school was like 15 years then, and for the first time, they actually had a financial backing to invest in the future of the product, um, not just run after the next, next big customer. So, we had a lot of opportunity, we still have that. We still have a lot of freedom to do engineering work that makes us proud in, in that way. That we want to do a good job and we are allowed to actually rewrite. We don't have to run for the next feature all the time. That's a really good thing and, and I think we've kind of convinced management above me as well that this, this is worth it. We are delivering new features based on this refactoring and we tell them really clearly that this is the reason. I think that works. Um, and currently, the optimizer is the weak link. Uh, so that's the obvious next step for us. Um, we do prototype at the moment. Um, we'll see uh, how it turns out, but it's looking very good so far. Um, 
And, um, but there's a lot of stuff to re-implement. Um, so it will take some time to, to get there. And then there's a long process ahead of us of performance testing to prove that it's good enough to be put into production. Uh, and I'm talking about refactoring things in 8.0. And uh, I don't think I dare turn this on in 8.0, uh, not by default at least. Um, this would be a 9.0 thing, I think. Um, I think that was my last yeah. slide, yeah. Uh, so before I kind of open for questions again, I just want to say thank you for, for inviting me to, to talk about MySQL. Um, we don't talk much about these kind of internals. We usually talk about features users can use or switches they can touch or settings they can tweak or that kind of thing. That's, that's what they like. Um, it's fun to actually talk about internals at some. I mean, we're, we're building a database system too. We, we hit, hit a lot of the same issues. So I'll, I'll yeah. applaud on behalf of everyone else. Again, thank you for staying up late for being here. And furthermore, also, thank you for giving a like sort of two-phase talk because it's like, first off, it's like, hey, cool, we did all this refactoring. And then it's like, okay, here's what we did refactor. Here's all the problems with the optimizer. So I appreciate you doing well, that. Yeah, you asked about the optimizer, and I had to put some positive things in there as well. That's why I wanted to do the whole pipeline. No, this, this, is, this, this is awesome. Like, because again, like I, I teach this stuff, and I don't. I'm like, I don't know what Postgres does. Or sorry, I don't know what MySQL does. But let's let's get the guy who built it right. Um, okay, so let's open the floor to some questions. Let's again, it's 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 midnight where normal is, so we don't want to go too late. Uh, please unmute yourself if you have any questions. So Joseph in the chat, do you want to do you want to ask your question if they're still here? Okay, uh, let's be look at the chat. Um, oh, it says the question is: Are you planning to feature flag the new optimizer? I assume yes. That what he said at the end. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, we, I think, we'll feature flag it in 8.0, um, and at the moment we can't run all queries. That's just the, the thing we, we don't support all syntax in there uh not window functions and cds we, we have a prototype that doesn't do that yet um and um yeah so we feature flag it and then maybe 9.0 will be aggressive and remove that flag um we'll see but i don't want to keep two optimizers at the same time that's that costs us a lot. Uh, so as soon as possible, when we think it's good enough, we'll throw it away, the, the old one. That's my, my idea at the moment, at least. Got it, okay. Um, the, I guess, I guess the, the last question I sort of ask would be like, um, in the same way that you have a pluggable storage engine, like a model for the architecture of MySQL, um, would you suspect you'd have to have a similar thing for the for the like the cost model for the query optimizer? Like because the query optimizer can have you know if you're just doing the DP search to do bottom up, like that's that's just you know taking the joins, doing the search. But at some point you have to have a I think the cost model be specific to so if you want to pick what yeah. join implementation you want to use, like if it's because if it's NDB and you might want to do broadcast join or distributed hash join, or like if it's if it's Rapids, actually, I don't know if Rapids is distributed or not. But like Rap Rapids is a common store, so it's it's uh, well, I, I don't know the details, but in my head, it's like C store in in a way. Okay, but that was that was the project Oracle at Oracle Labs, right? I thought they killed yeah. that, and, and and everyone everyone quit, right? It no, the the project the, the Rapid project is there, uh, okay. but it never got integrated into Oracle Oracle DB. Ah, ah okay, all right. They tried to they tried to do it differently. So Oracle DB tried to do this for partial plans. Uh, that idea was scrapped with MySQL. Um, and instead we said, no, we're going to do a complete offload or nothing. Got it. Okay. And then yes. maybe later on we can look at partial plans. But at the moment, complete offload and, and then on. So the idea here, um, just to talk about it's it's kind of doing analytics in sync with your OLTP. So there's snapshot snapshot isolation um, uh, or well, snapshot guarantees between InnoDB and, and Rapid. So it's automatically synced between the two engines. Mm -hmm. You insert into InnoDB and then it's automatically moved to Rapid. And then your analytic queries will go to, to Rapid. It's, um, it's, it's fractured mirrors. It's, it's with Oracle's MMR. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and then um, the idea is, of course, to compete against Redshift and all that thing, but uh, with one integrated solution. So 
that integration is is kind of my headache. Um, so yeah, we need some some kind of pluggable Cosmo. I don't like the word pluggable. Um, it has a bad bad feel to to us in the MySQL way. But um, some kind of adaptable Cosmo where where Rapid can say something to us about costing of of sub plans and and that kind of thing. And also they have different. Um, they have several different types of hash join variations of hash join that we can evaluate. They have other oper some other operations, they, but they pretty pretty well match what we have planned for in, in MySQL. So it's not it's a pretty good match, but they have some different ways of thinking. And of course, the the being a, a, a column store, the costs are different. So we have to we have to give them some configurability in in the in okay. statistics and, and that kind of thing. OK, again, Norval, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, the talk was fantastic. This is one of the best talks we've had uh, all season, because it's, again, it's the internals of the system that most people don't care about, but we care about. So thank you for doing this, and thank you for staying up late.